in this uh, talk sharing with you about a, a conference I presented at some years back. Uh, this was uh, run by Tricycle, which is a Buddhist magazine, an online forum. And I was invited as to be part of the opening presentation. They had a lineup of us, and we're each asked to address a key question in spiritual life, which is what really allows people to heal and awaken, to come into freedom. And we're each asked to give 10 minutes to that. Now just a little background, this, uh, this tricycle conference was held at the World Trade Center, and this was two weeks before 9-11. Uh, before so this, here we were, and so I was in this lineup of five presenters, and um, they were all very, very well known. I wasn't. I was the only woman. And they put me as the second person, which I thought was great because it gave me 10 minutes to kind of collect my thoughts and come into presence, but not too long to go insane, you know, with nervousness. <laughs> so um, there I was. And the first person to speak was Richard Baker Roshi, who's the Dharma hair to Suzuki Roshi, um, who I admired greatly. So he got up and his, he, he began saying, transformation or awakening comes down to two things, intention and attention. Thank you very much. And he sat down. <laughs> and I was sitting there going, you know, uh-oh, it's my turn. I wanted to get up and say, like he said, you know. I have no idea what I said, but I really remember what he said. And uh, really his his teaching is going to be what we'll be exploring tonight, which is really how the path of healing is energized and guided by intention. And the path of freedom is energized and guided by intention. And there's a kind of virtual, virtuous cycle that happens, which is that when we have the intention to wake up, so we're meditating, we have the intention to notice what's happening, we notice more. So intention energizes presence, and then because presence feels like home, we feel good there, that then motivates us more to have that intention to really live from presence. So it's kind of a virtuous cycle. But intention's a complex word. You know, the Buddha said that our, this entire world arises out of the tip of intention. You know, this entire world. And so when we explore it, we get that there's different levels and that we can have the intention to make a lot of money or to get a promotion or to prove ourselves in some way or to get revenge. And that's a very egoic level of intention. It solidifies the ego sense. It solidifies the wanting, fearing self. And in contrast, when our intention is, I just really want to, to love without holding back. Or I really want to see the truth of uh, who you are and who I am. These kind of intentions actually energize the path of realization. They move us, they turn us towards our full potential. So this latter kind of intention, I think of as a liberating intention. There's the egoic, and then there's a liberating kind of intention. And in Buddhism, it's often described as aspiration, our deepest aspiration. If you pay attention to anyone that you really trust as a very awake, very kind being, you'll discover hand in hand with that person's awakeness and kindness is an intention in that direction. It matters to them. This is uh, the Dalai Lama. Every day, every morning when he wakes up, he begins his day in this way. It's a prayer from Shantideva. And here, here are the words. May I be a guard for those who need protection, a guide for those on the path, a boat, a raft, a bridge for those to cross the flood. May I be a lamp in the darkness, a resting place for the weary, and a healing medicine for all who are sick. For as long as earth and sky endure, may I assist until all 
living beings are awakened. So this is the Dalai Lama's way of every day setting that kind of inner compass. This is the direction of my life. This is what matters. And we each need that kind of compass because there's so many tugs on us. We know that. Our conditioning, our culture, there's so many tugs that uh, we need a way of setting our direction, setting our intention. You wouldn't be here, and if you're listening to a podcast, right, you would not be listening unless you had some of those very deep, pure currents of, of a liberating intention. No matter what reason you think you are listening, there's something that is yearning for truth and yearning for freedom. And in a similar way, we wouldn't be helpful to a loved one or we wouldn't get involved in a creative project or we wouldn't spend time in nature unless there was some of this flavor of liberating intention. But the truth is, if we look at our day, and I think it's important to do this, huge swaths of our day are not guided by or connected to that kind of intention. And um, instead, what we find out is that um, you know we're we're caught up in in different currents that are really more to do with wanting and fearing, and the more stressed we are, the less we're tapped in. When I lead guided meditations, um, I always start with some getting into presence and then asking, "What is it that matters to our hearts?" And I'm aware that. For some people, we can ask that question, but if we're not really present, we're going to get some prepackaged response. You know, like it's it's going to maybe the right words, like you know, I want to have more presence or I want to be kinder to others. But it's just a kind of voice in our mind, and we're not. It's not embodied. It's not like we really are caring, and that's okay. I mean, I have I sometimes have people come after class and say, you know, you you lead that that reflection on what's my deepest intention. I don't have the foggiest notion what my deepest intention is. And that's okay too. The first step is just getting the knack of remembering to even ask the question. Okay? Because when we start putting the light of attention on something, then reality starts unfolding itself. So we start beginning to become discerning and noticing, oh, right now I'm just operating off of egoic intentions. Like, you know, what's being, what's driving me is, uh, you know, that I really want to check things off the list so I can feel like I don't have as much to do. When we are being driven by an intention that's really navigating, that's really moving us through the day, the key feature of that is that it's embodied. In other words, if, you're, if, if an intention's impacting you, it's because something matters. And it could be something matters that you're drawn to take a nap, or it could be that you're drawn to comfort a friend. It's something that matters. So I'm giving you right now a key uh, signature of intention. It has to matter. It has to be alive in your body. You know, this in the Supreme Court, there's a kind of question of like, what's really behind some of the decisions? And Chief Justice Douglas wrote this. He said, 90% of the decisions made in the Supreme Court are made on the basis of emotions. And then the other 10% is what's used to rationalize those emotions. The real decisions in our life come from our emotions. Um, Colors Castaneda, who writes about the shaman Don Juan. He writes, Conclusions arrived at through reasoning have very little or no influence in altering the course of our lives. So what I'm getting at is emotions and the way that they express their intentions are a really major force in our life our life emerges out of the tip of intention. So it becomes a very, very important question. What's our intention? What's really driving us in any moment? 
much of the day we'll find that our intention is driven by some need to feel more secure, some need to soothe ourselves, some need to prove ourselves, this egoic level. I have a drawing here of people in a 12-step group and one guy is saying, Hi, my name is Barry and I check my email two to three hundred times a day. <laughs> How many of you feel like you have an addiction to email? Can I see? You know, just to keep checking, can I see? Yeah. So this is, there's some intention in there. There's something in us that wants to be engaged, get distract, distract ourselves with something that wants to feel plugged into something else. Um, it's another way of consuming. And the truth is that we will always be driven by intention that's really strong in the limbic system, but then justify it with our rational mind. Like in this story, a mother was preparing pancakes for her sons Kevin 5 and Ryan 3. The boys began to argue over who would get the first pancake. Mom saw an opportunity for a moral lesson and said, if Jesus was sitting here, he would say, let my brother have the first pancake. I can wait. Kevin turned to his younger brother and said, Ryan, you can have the first chance at being Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> what we're going to be exploring together is waking up and getting more aware when we're in the midst of things, of what intention's really going on, because it affects the outcomes in our life. And we start noticing in our communications with each other that on some level we're trying to get approved of. You know, that if we're really honest, we're wanting the other person to like, like us in some way or be impressed with us some way. We're trying to look smart. We're trying to avoid error. We're trying to get the person to cooperate. It's important to watch our motives because they are felt energetically by the other person. So if we're interested in real, authentic relating, we need to be uh, on to ourselves in that way. So personal story um, is that uh, two mornings a week, my husband Jonathan and I meditate together, and then we do a kind of check-in, and it's exploring what's going on for each other. And, and during these times, I'm usually the ones particularly intent on making sure we communicate about anything that might be creating separation. And I'm intent and I'm also a little controlling about it at times, but I'm just going to put that out there. So earlier last week we started chatting and by the end we had talked about everything and anything but our relationship. So before we ended I asked, so how are we doing? You know, I said, is there anything you feel would be good for us to pay attention to? And then I kind of sat back because I thought, now that was skillful. I put that out really well and, you know, I was kind of self-satisfied. And um, I was on my turf, you know. He started squirming around, uh, you know, kind of uh, trying hard to come up with something. He looked at me hoping he'd get some clues, you know, like, is there something I'm missing here? You know, that kind of thing. He had that uh, deer-in-the-headlights look. But I just stayed quiet, waiting to see what he'd come up with. And then he got a very familiar, mischievous look, and he pulled out his iPhone, and he asked Siri <laughs> how to respond when your wife asks, how are we doing? <laughs> Within moments, he had the answer, and I want to, this is honest to God. This is what Siri responded. I'm okay, you're okay, and this is the best of all possible worlds. <laughs> I gave up, she's too good, you know? <laughs> so we went on to plan an evening kayak or something else. I mean, I gave up. What was really fun when we were debriefing was just watching the levels of intention. Like here I had asked such a benign thing, you know, so how are we doing? And so the moral of the story is watch out when somebody grabs for their iPhone <laughs> when you've asked them something. But we're often in, it's sometimes a veil we don't see in some sort of a trance where we're being driven by um, 
some want or some fear that we're, that's not in consciousness. And if it's not in consciousness, it's controlling us. So let me ask you just to take a moment to uh, check in. I'd like to do this to really see how this is alive for you. And you might, as you check in, just review today a little these last hours and just to ask yourself so what has been the predominant intention that has been moving me, guiding me, directing me quite natural that sometimes the intention is when we feel stressed and we're trying to get more comfortable, trying to (coughs) take care of business. And you might have found there also is an intention to be present or to be helpful. Just, just, Just notice what's true and see if without any judgment, just to get a sense of what was the the quality or kind of intention that was there. You might consider that the beginning of moving towards more liberating intention is just that you sense that matters to you, that you want to remember. In one of her poems, Mary Oliver describes kneeling prayer-like in a field, and she's contemplating with wonder a grasshopper who's gazing around with enormous, complicated eyes. She writes, Tell me, what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? What do you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? opening your eyes if you'd like to. So part of our, our daily trance is not, we're not, rather than that frame of this, this precious life, we're in a kind of routine and it's as if it's just going to keep going and going and going. And we forget that uh, life is fleeting. And sometimes it's not until something happens, something major happens to shake the grounds that we actually reconnect in some deep way with that more liberating intention. There's a a woman, Alison Ballantine, who's a pediatric physician who was asked to give the commencement address for graduating physicians a few years ago where she taught. And... uh, she sent me what she, she sent me a copy of what she read and what she spoke to the group. And I want to share a piece of this with you because I found it so moving. She said, we become so accustomed to life on the hamster wheel of achievement and approval that we just forget. We scamper on and on chasing the ephemeral promises of someday all or if only. She said, growing up I learned a hard lesson about how that hamster wheel can cheat us. My father was a pediatric surgeon with tremendous enthusiasm and drive to succeed that encompassed his work, his family, and his friendships. He was a huge influence in my life. He taught me the value of hard work and the satisfaction of a job done right. 
But on a winter day when he was driving home from the hospital where he worked, his car slid on a patch of black ice, hitting a telephone pole on the driver's side, killing him instantly. He was 48 and I was 18. She goes on to say this is part of what serves as a reminder of her that I cannot live my life on the hamster wheel waiting for some day, or if only I. And she closes her talk offering the graduates these words. She says, what you have is in the present moment and it is unfathomably precious. I heard a a similar message from a woman who had a maybe two-year-old daughter and she had was diagnosed with breast cancer and had a year to live and her mantra was no time to rush no time to rush so this is the wisdom of impermanence if we really want to start cultivating and nourishing a liberating intention if we want to It doesn't mean we don't take care on an egoic level, but if we want to be tapped into the what really matters, this wisdom of impermanence is really important. It's truth. So we begin to look, we'll just look a little more closely at what happens, that when we have that wisdom of impermanence, we get clear more on what matters, and we also start looking at how we're living our life through new eyes we start seeing just how distracted we are. This is Rumi, he says, gamble everything for love if you are a true human being. Half-heartedness doesn't reach into majesty. You set out to find God, but then you keep stopping for long periods at mean-spirited roadhouses. (laughs) Hey, it's wonderful, isn't that great? You set out to find God, but then you keep stopping for long periods at mean-spirited roadhouses. So let's uh, explore a little what helps us awaken from a more egoic level of intention to liberating intent. And and I'll read you uh, D.H. Lawrence, uh, who I think says beautifully, he says, men are not free doing just what they want. Men are only free when they are doing what the deepest self likes. And there's getting down to the deepest self. It takes some diving. So what allows us to dive, this is probably the key of everything, what allows us to dive is this present-centered attention. You know, when we're talking to ourselves all the time, in the future, in the past, we keep re-solidifying this, this um, very confined world, a world of a self and others out there, and a world where we need to get more done and where something's missing and where we're not enough. And of course our intention's gonna come out of that. It's because we keep talking to ourselves. One of Don Juan's teachings, this is the shaman again, is that when we stop talking to ourselves, that world dissolves and there's some majesty that really starts opening up. So we dive by learning to come into presence, to quiet some of that persistent inner dialogue so that we can listen in a more deep way to our heart and spirit. So the, the, so the basic notion is if we don't have some capacity to attend to what's here and now, we cannot attend to what most matters. And this is, I think, said beautifully by uh, Denise Levertov in her poem, Flickering Mind. She says, she's speaking to, to God, she says, Lord, not you, it is I who am absent. I stop to think of you or think about you and my mind at once like a minnow darts away darts into the shadows that gleams like frets unceasing over the rivers purling and passing. Not for one second will myself hold still, but wanders anywhere, everywhere can turn. Not you, it is I am absent. 
You are the stream, the fish, the light, the pulsing shadow. You, the unchanging presence in whom all moves and changes. How can I focus my flickering, perceive at the fountain's heart the sapphire I know is there? This diving, this coming home into a liberating intent um, is made possible as we begin to quiet and listen to that sapphire in the depths of the fountain. Quiet and listen. What is going on right here? When we bring the light of awareness to our intention, what we might find is, okay, what's going on is I'm wanting to prove myself, or I'm wanting approval, or I'm wanting to numb myself so I don't have to feel this. But if we keep paying to attention to that intention, it'll start unfolding into something increasingly pure and deep. And I want to give you uh, an example of this that, that touched me. This is a, a woman that was describing how she had had, a dec- had decades of a standoff with her older sibling, her older sister. And as a young person, she was kind of the, the hippie of the family, kind of impulsive and non-traditional. And she also was the bad girl. She got into all sorts of trouble when she was younger. And even as she got older, she continued to kind of blurt out the wrong thing and then feel misunderstood and unappreciated. So she and her sister were di- distant and there was a tension and she had once really um, kind of offended enough so that she wasn't even invited to one of the niece's weddings after a particularly bad argument. So there was, there was a, a real estrangement. But now, as she described it, her dad had died and their mom was sick and so they were starting to be forced together. And this happens in families. There can be an estrangement then all of a sudden for life circumstances were forced together and then what happens? So there they were. It was a Thanksgiving gathering and she was, you know, a more mature person and she was decided she was going to draw on her meditation practice but she was ready for a difficulty that would inevitably come with her sister and sure enough they were talking about her mother's diet and this woman suggested that her mother would be healthier if it was gluten free because of some problems her mother was ha- having the older sister just got fed up she was everything has to fit with your philosophy here you go again and she left the room kind of in anger and frustration and this woman was stuck feeling just like she had felt at age 8 and 12 and 14. Once again, uh, she dislikes me, she doesn't respect me, I'm not okay. Something's wrong with me. And, um, but this time, instead of the flickering mind that darts around and gets into reaction, she says, okay, let me be present. And she started paying attention to what was really going on. And she said, okay, so what's my intention? What's been going on? And she realized her intention was she wanted her sister's respect. She wanted to be seen as being knowledgeable, as being okay. So this is her egoic intention. And it's a fine intention. And in fact, her her next response was just to, as I sometimes put my hand on my heart, just to be kind towards that intention. And I'll pause here and say, when you start noticing egoic intention, that's not a time to judge. There'll be no dropping deeper if you judge. That's a time to be very compassionate, of course. Of course that was her, her habit, okay? So she got in touch with the habit, okay, want approval, want this, and was very, very kind towards it. And she said, what really am I wanting? And she kept listening, and there was a kind of a softening and opening. And she knew that underneath getting that, that um, approval is that she really wanted to feel connected. She wanted loving connection. And so she let, she, as she started feeling that, that's when her body resonated, like, that's what I really, really want, and that became her prayer. She re-entered the scene that evening, and for the rest of the evening, uh, she was more more relaxed, didn't need to insert her opinion or defend herself, and it, the, it, things went much more easily. Okay, the next next holiday, Hanukkah came, 
And there was more Eve and the ease, and they even, the sisters even laughed together over some old family stories. And later that night, her, her sister told her uh, about a, a tough time she was having with her youngest, her teenage son. Something had shifted, and then her older sister said, and thank you for listening. You're being a good shoulder to, to lean on. There's a real power in staying with and tracing back intention. For her, she, she, there's a, a phrase I love, not my will, but my heart's will. My will is the egoic intention. It's okay, be kind towards it. But then sense, what's your heart's real longing? And for her, she had to release this demand that her sister understand or appreciate. She had to release that. And underneath it, she could then feel, okay, I want to connect. We move through the world with each other and we're energetically communicating our intention. If your intention is to prove yourself or look smart or this or that, person might be impressed, but someplace in them, they're also feeling your intention. And those egoic intentions create distance. We're layered. I think, of it, I think of our intentions as marbled, but when we start shining the light of awareness on, on it with real kindness, then the purity begins to express itself more and more, and it becomes our prayer, becomes a liberating intention. Maybe we'll take a moment to reflect. I'll give you a chance to explore how you might uh, work with this one in life. So this is a pause where you can just take a moment to come into your body, to feel yourself here, to feel your breath, As we've described, if the mind is, is all distracted, it's very hard to pay attention to the heart and what really matters. So you can bring yourself back right here by feeling the aliveness in your body, feeling the breath at the heart. You might sense your intention to be right here. And from this presence, you might sense a situation in your life where you encounter some conflict with somebody, perhaps. And not, not a situation where it's major rage or trauma that comes up, but just some conflict. And if you have a situation like that in mind, where there's tension and distance, easy misunderstanding, offense, you might review the situation and go right to the point of where, where there's the most kind of estrangement, where you feel most, uh, in some way, that there's your adversarial, aggressive or defensive. And pause. Pause where you feel the emotional reactivity. And just let yourself feel the reactivity, whether it's hurt or anger, whatever it is. And, and this is time to mindfully inquire. So what, is, what has been my intention right now? What am I trying to get from this person or make happen? Very often we're trying to control things to feel better about ourselves, to feel safer. What's your intention?
as you sense into it. It's usually this egoic layer, or it's kind of driven by the limbic system or our wants and fears are active. Take a moment to offer some genuine kindness. This is human, this is natural, it's okay. It's, it's critical to, to take the moment to offer a gesture of kindness. And if it helps you to put your hand on your heart and just really, it's okay. You know, this is a natural human response. Everybody is rigged to respond with this egoic level of intention. Everybody. We all have that. Trying to control things in some way. It's just offering kindness, gentleness, and then with some real interest, keep listening inward and sense what, what matters most to me with this relationship. What's most important? What's really my deepest, most compelling intention? Knowing it's not always easy to contact or live from it, but you can have a sense of it being there and a prayer for that. May this be what it is. May this guide me. This more liberating intention. And you might sense in the days and weeks to come the possibility of pausing when there's some conflict and reactivity. And instead of the old pathways of judging or withdrawing or lashing out, just pausing and just saying, okay, what's my intention right now? If you have a chance to do that. And being kind towards yourself and then sensing what really matters. What really matters. feeling free to open your eyes if you'd like. So, so often what happens is I'll, I'll get the question, how do I know if it's a liberating intention? Like, how do I know if I really have touched into a deep aspiration? And I, I'd like to put out a, po- a kind of road map I find helpful, a few different characteristics that let you know when you've really tapped into a liberating intention. And the first one has to do with the content of the intention, which is a liberating intention has to do with manifesting our innate potential. It's not about becoming different than we are, it's about unfolding what's already inherent to our being. It's like the, the, flower, the flower aspiring to bloom, that we aspire to express our creativity or to embody love or to serve from our hearts. Um, there's a there's a story I read about the Bantu tribe, where uh, there is a ritual when the children are sleeping. The father goes around and with each to each child and whispers in his his or her ear, "Be who you are." I think that's the essence of a liberating intention: is to truly, truly embody the love and the awareness that's our nature. But there's different language for it. But, I, but I, this is in contrast to the aspiration that, God damn it, I'm going to hike the Appalachian Trail, you know? Or the aspiration, you know, I'm, I'm going to create an app for instant samadhi, or, you know, whatever it is. You know, it's like, it's not about setting a new goal or a thing to do. It's about manifesting what's possible. That's one piece. The second I mentioned earlier, which is, you know it's a true aspiration, a liberating intention when it's embodied. It's like your body zings with it. Your body knows. It's sincere. You know the word sincere from, it's from the old English when they used to put wax over their, I think their their silverware, their, what they used, whatever forks and knives and so on. Sincere means without wax. There's no covering, so it's just that real, immediate tenderness. There's an innocent quality. It's embodied, innocent, tender. Here's Oprah Winfrey. She says, 
thoughts before you agree to do anything that might add even the smallest amount of stress to your life. Ask yourself, what is my truest intention? Give yourself time to let a yes resound within you. When it's right, I guarantee that your entire body will feel it. Okay? So you get the idea. Of, so we've got the first, the first piece of an of a authentic, liberating intention is really its intention to, be, to live truth of what we are to help others live the truth. It's, an, it's to manifest potential. And the second piece, embodied, sincere, without wax, innocent. The third one is that an authentic, liberating intention always relates to this moment. It's the inquiry of, what does my spiritual life aspire to in this moment? So it, it's, it's not like um, that in five years I aspire to be patient and kind. A liberating intention is, please, may that kindness be here. You might remember St. Augustine, he, he writes this, he says, Dear Lord, please give me chastity and continence, but not yet. <laughs> <laughs> so, so those are the three. A liberating intention, when it's towards being all that we are, when it's alive with caring, and when it has to do with right now living it right this moment. It's like that bumper sticker one friend told me she saw in the Beltway. It says, if you lived in your heart, you'd be home right now. (laughs) (laughs) So I started uh, in this talk with with the Dalai Lama and, and how, and this beautiful way, every day he starts to set the compass of his heart and there's an understanding that where our attention goes, energy flows. And the more we bring attention to what matters, any moment you ask yourself just that simple question, what most matters, you are opening the windows and the doors of your heart to the life that's here, to the potential that's here, just by asking the question. And the more purposefully we practice with intention, like letting it be a daily practice, letting impermanence really, really guide us, uh, the more alive it becomes. So we'll close with a practice I try to do whenever I have a chance. Some of you have done this with me before, which is uh, an aspiration practice uh, where we do remember impermanence. And so if you've been sitting long and you're uncomfortable, just move around a little bit and find yourself, you know, a way to sit that most allows you to feel alert and relaxed. Knowing this uh, flickering mind that darts all over, you might take some moments to establish presence, to, to feel yourself really coming into your body with your senses awake. Take some moments to listen, receptive. nothing to do with listening, just letting the spontaneous knowing of sound. And with that same receptivity, listening to and feeling the life that's right here inside you. Noticing that you can relax a little, just soften and relax a little. Perhaps extend the breath a bit, a deep, full in-breath and a slow out-breath. You feel the aliveness, let your senses be awake. Sense a quietness that's here. And begin by imagining that you have a year to live that that's real, you have a year to live. 
And just take a moment to sense, how do you want to live? What matters? What's the quality of heart, mind, beingness that matters to you? And that now you have a month, just a month, sense that. Listen to your heart, what matters? How do you want to live? How do you want to be in relationship with others? How do you want to be in relationship with your inner life? What's the quality of heart, mind, being that matters? Now you have a day. This is it, just a day. How do you want to move through the hours of this day and the moments of this day? What really matters? What's the quality of being that you want to embody or manifest? It's just a few moments now. You just have a few moments, a minute or two minutes. What is it that matters right now? Right now. This is it. What most matters? What's the deepest intention or prayer? bringing your intention right into this moment and just being, being what matters. Being that love, being that awareness. Closing by sensing the sincerity of your prayer that what you know most matters be remembered, that what most matters guide you, that moment by moment you can embody and live from the truth of who you are. Namaste and thank you.